you will hear a student talking to the study abroad coordinator at her university. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi, Leela. Please sit down. So you are interested in studying abroad next year, right? Yes, that's right. I've always wanted to live and to study in South America. Okay. Well, I have to go over a few things with you first, Leela. Once I get some information, I can tell you about studying abroad. What is your last name? Kim. That's K I M H. Corbin asked Leela for her last name, Kim, so this has been written in the notes. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, Leela. Please sit down. So you were interested in studying abroad next year, right? Yes, that's right. I've always wanted to live and study in South America. Okay. Well, I have to go over a few things with you first, Leela. Once I get some information, I can tell you about studying abroad. What is your last name? Kim. That's K I M H. Okay. Now, when are you interested in studying abroad? I want to study my entire third year of university abroad. Wow, that's a long while, but well worth it. Have you ever lived or studied abroad before? Yes, I took a summer language program in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Will you be applying for financial aid for your year abroad? I think I will be. Living costs are lower in South America, but plane tickets can be very expensive. What kind of degree do you want? I plan to obtain a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish and Latin American history. I'm especially interested in how countries there became democracies. That sounds very interesting. Do you have any idea what countries you want to study in? I think I'll do one semester in Bolivia and then another semester in Peru. That's all the basic information I need. Just ask if you need anything else. Before you hear the rest of the dialogue, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Now, Leela, there are some things I have to explain to you about going abroad for a year. You know that it can be difficult at times. Yes, actually, I had a friend who went to China for just a semester. She said the language barrier was quite a problem. Actually, not only is there a language barrier, there are also cultural differences that can make living or studying in another country very difficult. You mentioned going abroad before. But over the course of a year, some people can experience severe loneliness. I think I'm prepared to deal with that. Also, you have to be organised when it comes to applying for your study abroad program. Our university here may not accept every course you take abroad. You have to make sure with your academic adviser about which ones are appropriate, and will count towards your degree. Understood. Thanks for the advice. Actually, I did want to go over the application procedure briefly with you. I read it on the website, but yes, it can be slightly confusing. First of all, please remember to keep your grade point average at three point two or above. There are high standards for those sponsored by the school to study in another country. Once you have declared your major, you can begin your research into which programs you want to go to. After filling out the appropriate application, you will submit them to the Office of Study Abroad. After they review your materials, you will be informed about whether or not you can study abroad under the university's name. You will also be informed about how much financial aid you will receive. Sounds slightly daunting. Well, from what I have seen, I don't think you need to worry. Okay, then I'll print the forms from the online website now and get started. Good luck, Leela. Thank you so much.
No problem. If you have any other questions, please email or call. I will. Bye then. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two on page four. Section 2. You will hear a recorded message giving information about an English hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15 on page 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to the Bridge Hotel Information Line. The Bridge Hotel is part of the Compact Group, which is a large association of family-owned hotels, offering a warm, friendly atmosphere and high-quality service at competitive prices. All of them cater for a wide range of people, from business to leisure clients. Set in a quiet residential area on the attractive outskirts of Belford, about three miles from the city centre, the Bridge Hotel is a popular choice for conferences. After recent refurbishment and expansion, it now has 25 double rooms and 20 singles. All 45 are en suite with TV and coffee and tea making facilities. The Bridge Hotel is set in three and a half hectares of grounds, with an open-air swimming pool and four tennis courts. There is also a newly opened gym with fitness suite, which is considered one of the best equipped in the area. Non-resident membership is available. We have a fully licensed restaurant for residents and non-residents, which provides a wide range of dishes with a particular focus on dishes from around the world. For the discerning business customer, we have designated business rooms with phone links allowing full internet access. Our conference facilities cater for up to 200 delegates and we are able to offer transport to guests to and from Birmingham Airport at a small extra cost. Before you hear the rest of the message, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20 on page 5. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. There now follows information about short break packages. Welcome to the Bridge Hotel Short Breaks Information Line. We offer three packages, two-day, three-day and five-day. The two-day costs £75 per person per night and includes full cooked breakfast and evening entertainment. Very popular for weekend getaways. The three-day break costs £60 per person per night and in addition to offers for the two-day break, includes one four-course dinner. This allows guests to enjoy the full range of hotel facilities. 
The five-day break costs £52 per person per night and, in addition to offers from the two- and three-day breaks, includes free beauty therapy on two days and a full-day pass to a golf club. This package is particularly popular with couples who want a completely relaxing break. If you would like more information about these special packages, call extension 3469 to speak to our customer service manager, John Martin. Thank you for calling the Bridge Hotel information line. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3 on page 203. Section 3. You will hear two students talking about a class assignment about wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25 on page 203. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions 21 to 25. Okay, let's go over the requirements and see what we have left to do. Let's see. We have to give the professor a written summary of the information we've gathered on our topic, wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. The other written thing we have to turn in is a case study of the rehabilitation of one bird. We have the information on that already. Right. All we have to do is write it up. What about charts and graphs? Do we need to include something like that? I don't think so. They aren't really relevant, but we do have to turn in a list of the resources we used. Naturally. What about videos? I heard some of the other students were doing that. Well, I guess that must be optional, because I don't see it on the requirements list. OK, we should start planning our class presentation, since that counts for half the grade. We've looked at lots of sources of information, but I think our best source was the interviews we did with the wildlife rehabilitators. Agreed. That and the journal articles. I think we have enough information from those two sources for the presentation anyhow. The books we looked at weren't all that helpful. I wonder if we should try to bring in some live birds for the presentation. That would be too difficult, don't you think? But we have lots of photos of rehabilitated birds. We can show those. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30 on page 204. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Right. OK, I think we should start by talking about how to rescue a bird. Probably first we should help people understand which birds need rescuing. Yeah, that's really important. Because a lot of times people see a baby bird that's all alone, or they find a bird sitting on the ground and they think it needs to be rescued. And usually, those are just baby birds learning to fly. So we should emphasize that people should only attempt to rescue a bird that's clearly injured. 
For certain kinds of birds, the rescuer needs to wear protective gloves because some of those birds have sharp claws and can tear your shirt or, worse, injure your face or some other part of your body. Yes, that's an important point. OK, next, let's tell people to put the injured bird in a box, a box with good air circulation. We should let them know that a cage isn't necessary and a bag, especially a plastic one, could hurt the bird more. Another thing we need to say is that the best way to help the bird stay calm is not by petting it or talking to it, but by leaving it completely alone. Then people should take the bird to the bird rescue center as soon as possible. Right. And we should also point out that when they're driving the bird to the rescue center, it's better not to play music on the radio or talk loudly, because those things just stress the bird. Yes. It's better just to speak quietly while you have the bird in the car. OK, we've got that part covered. Next, we should talk about what happens at the rescue center. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on archaeology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 33. Many thanks for inviting me along today to talk to you about the results of some very interesting recent archaeological research. The saying, you are what you eat, is often applied to present-day dietary advice. Certainly, our bodies will show evidence of whether we eat healthily or live on fast food and takeaways. This can be particularly useful in archaeological research. Through a careful analysis of the ancient bones of our ancestors, we can tell a great deal about their diet and the way they lived. I'd like to talk to you today about some research into the early settlers of some remote tropical islands in the Pacific. When these people travelled to these new lands 3,000 years ago, they had to bring along all the resources they needed for survival including food, plants and animals from their original homes. One such group were the Lapita people, who were early settlers of remote Oceania, several islands in the Pacific. When the Lapita set sail for the island Vanuatu, they brought with them domestic animals and crop plants. This allowed them to settle in an area where no humans had previously lived and that had limited natural resources. Archaeologists have been keen to discover to what extent these settlers and their domestic animals relied on the resources they'd brought with them compared to the native plants and animals they found on the island. Before you hear more of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 37. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 37.
In order to try and understand the diet and lives of the Lapita people, archaeologists analyse the chemical composition of the bones of 50 adults excavated from the Lapita Cemetery on Ifate Island, Vanuatu. Depending on what we eat, we consume varying amounts of carbon, nitrogen and sulphur. As these chemical elements are ultimately deposited in our bones, the amounts or ratios of each one can provide a sort of dietary signature. For instance, plants incorporate nitrogen into their tissues, and as animals eat plants and other animals, nitrogen builds up in their own system. The presence of different ratios of chemical elements may show whether a human or an animal ate plants, animals, or both. Carbon and sulphur ratios offer another clue to diet. Carbon ratios, for example, differ between land and water organisms, as do sulphur ratios, the values of which are much higher in aquatic organisms compared to land-based organisms. As well as examining the settlers' bones, scientists carried out a comprehensive analysis of the chemical elements found in the settlers' likely food sources. This included modern and ancient plants and animals. They found that early Lapita inhabitants of Vanuatu may have searched for food rather than relying entirely on food they'd grown themselves during the early stages of colonisation. In the longer term, they probably did grow and consume food from the resources they'd brought with them, but early on, they appear to have relied as much on a mixture of fish, marine turtles and fruit bats, as well as their own domestic land animals. Before you hear more of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 38 to 39. Now listen and answer questions 38 to 39. The archaeologists believe that this analysis of diet may also provide clues to the culture of the settlers. For one thing, males had much higher nitrogen levels compared to females, which indicates greater access to meat. This difference in food consumption may support the hypothesis that Lapita societies were ranked in some way, or it may suggest dietary differences associated with the work people were involved in. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at question 40. Now listen and answer question 40. Additionally, the archaeologists analysed ancient pig and chicken bones and found that carbon levels in the settlers' domestic animals indicated that they were eating a diet mainly of plants. However, their nitrogen levels indicate that they may also have roamed freely, eating food such as insects. This would have allowed the Lapita people to keep food resources that were in short supply for themselves, rather than feeding them to their domestic animals. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. <laughs> 